Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Janet Benkovic. In this Women of Grace series, we are talking about the interior life. Our guest, Dan Burke, has been sharing his spiritual journey with us. Today, he will tell us about coming into the Catholic Church and enlighten us about the stages of growth in union with God. It's part three in our series, Spiritual Life, Spiritual Direction, God in You. We are women of grace from the throne of the Lord Most High. Yesterday, I gave you an assignment as the program closed. I'm not going to check your notebooks, but I'm hoping that you fulfilled your assignment. I asked you to think about Dan's story in light of the three stages of the spiritual life. These three stages of interior growth are named the purgative stage, the illuminative stage, and the unitive stage. Were you able to identify them in Dan's story? I sure hope so. But if not, don't worry. By the end of our program, I'm sure you'll see them quite clearly. Let's welcome Dan Burke. He is the executive director of EWTN's National Catholic Register and author of this wonderful book, Navigating the Interior Life, Spiritual Direction, and the Journey to God. Hey, Dan, welcome back today. It's great to be back again. Thank you very much. I, I you know, I've, 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 I've calmed down. Uh, our Holy Spirit showed up on the set yesterday, and it was such a beautiful moment. And uh, I know that anyone who watched the program yesterday was deeply touched by your story. And the good news is the story isn't over yet. Uh, and you shared with us at the close of the program that, you know, you were deeply attracted to the early church father, so you began a deeper investigation, and it led you to consider I'm going to say three, um, I, at this point they weren't really options, but three areas that you felt needed further attention on your part. One was Eastern Orthodoxy, the other was the Anglican faith, and the third was Catholicism, which you rejected out of hand yeah. because of your misconceptions yeah. about Holy Mother Church. Exactly. So I, uh, to try to get past my own, I recognized my biases regarding Mary were probably imbalanced. Yeah, and, and you found her in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Oh, right? they love Mary as I, much as Catholics do. I know, <laughs> I know, we love her so. So uh, I took a course on Mary from one of the St. Vladimir Seminary and uh, really couldn't get past it. Uh, I was still very ensconced in, by that time I was staunchly Calvinist theologically, soteriologically, so, uh, and the solas of the Reformation, sola fide and sola scriptura, uh, those were really deeply embedded in my theology. And so uh, I, uh, because a lot of the, the church's revelation about Mary is extra biblical, though all rooted in scripture, but certainly revelation prior, private revelations and others, and proclamations of the church, um, uh, I just couldn't, uh, you know, it was, a, it was just a real serious challenge for me to, if it wasn't directly clearly in scripture, I couldn't accept it at that point. So I rejected the Orthodox, though at the time, the, I was gifted by a great Orthodox writer who, who dismantled Sola Scriptura for me, or began the, to dismantle it for me and helped me recognize that Sola Scriptura itself is not a biblical idea, mm -hmm. which is Sola Scriptura, for those who don't know, is this idea that Scripture alone is the only way we know and understand the will and person of God and, his, and, uh, and doctrine. And so the Orthodox began to chip away at that uh, but then I was encountered a, 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 a orthodox or an Orthodox Anglican group that really was um, faithful to tradition. The masses were very much like you'd experience in uh, the beautiful masses we have here at EWTN. Yes. And of course, they weren't a true mass, but uh, the liturgy was beautiful, very compelling to me. And they also believed in justification by faith alone. So they were very Reformation oriented in their doctrine, but very Catholic in their worship. So I began to attend there, and uh, somebody grabbed me and said, you should be a priest, because I was so intent in my studies and that sort of thing. And I said, okay, I'll be a priest, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. she sounds a little silly. <laughs> but I thought, really. well, you know, I'm very passionate about my faith, and I, I spend all my extra time outside of work studying, and, and so I entered into seminary there. And in the seminary, 
they ha they had us pray the their equivalent to the liturgy of the hours. Um, they asked me to create an altar in my home, and I had to get an icon of Jesus and Mary, mm. which was an amazing uh, thing and very difficult for me. Long story short, uh, I started to um, recognize some of the deficiencies in uh, the Protestant conception of authority, which were only partially resolved in the Anglican Church. And in seminary, all of my texts were Catholic. Uh, by that time, I was wearing a cassock and a collar, but I was also reading um, John Paul II, and uh, Theology of the Body was just extraordinary to me. But at the same time as well, the mystical tradition of the Catholic Church was gripping me very in a very profound way. And I f uh, looking back, I feel like Teresa of Avila in particular had me by the collar and was dragging me into the church, even though I was resisting the whole way. But uh, so I ended up uh, in, uh, at, uh, as part of the assignment from the seminary, they said, you have to go to an Episcopal church in Denver area where I was living. And so I just picked one. It was the closest one to me. And by God's, another miracle of his grace, the priest in that parish was in the process of converting to Catholicism under Archbishop Chaput. Can you get over it? I mean, can you get over this God of ours? Yes. I mean, he, you know, it says in sacred scripture, he orders our steps, right? right? Yeah. I mean, your steps were ordered. He had this path clearly defined and marked out for you. <laughs> that was just crazy. I love it. It's oh crazy. my goodness. So this priest and I wrestled quite a bit. Because I was not, I was reluctant. Yeah. Um, but it, the, my idea of the Anglican church as being a true expression of the body of Christ and, and the priest of the Anglican Church having valid authority was crumbling pretty quickly, but I just could not see my way to the Catholic Church. So this wonderful priest argued with me to the point where I even irritated him to where he said, okay, I'm done arguing with you, you know. Uh, but he would give me uh, CDs like from Scott Hahn and Tim Gray, and, and, uh, and uh, I was teaching a course then on, on the 39 Articles, which is their confession, mm -hmm. and comparing it to Catholicism and Lutheranism and Calvinism. And after every class, he would argue with me. This was when I were on for like nine months. He and another priest attended the class. And uh, anyway, um, I uh, finally began to yield through probably John Paul the second Blessed John Paul, softened my heart. His approach to scripture and the beauty of his uh, vision of the human person uh, was just so extraordinary to me. And um, so I, I found the nearest Catholic church and entered into RCIA. Uh, this is, you know, brings us to a close of, of this part of my story, but it's really the beginning. It's really, I was in the purgative way, which we're gonna get to from about you know, my uh, coming to Christ, you could say. For a Catholic, that would be their baptism. But I was baptized as an adult, so coming to Christ. So that was all the purgative stage. And even as I entered into the church, I was in that stage for some time. But I, I entered into RCIA, and I started going to the classes, which w the people were wonderful. I happened to have a mix of real wonderful uh, teachers and things like that. But uh, I was going to Mass every Sunday, of course. And, but I believed that the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ was there on the altar. I believed it with all my heart, and I couldn't take it, not, not going to I, you all were going to partake in this wonderful feast, the banquet feast of Christ, and I'm sitting back there going, I gotta sit through more of this RCIA class, because I had argued against Catholicism for years, and so I found myself, even in this class, arguing the Catholic position in the class. And so I got fed up one Sunday and left Mass in the middle and said, I'm not, I'm, next time I'm coming back, I want to partake in the Eucharist. So I called the head of RCIA, who was a Carmelite, wonderful Carmelite, discalced, secular. I think Teresa had her hand on you. I oh, think she man. was pulling it. Well, wait till you, <laughs> wait till you hear the end of the story. <laughs> so I, uh, I told her, I said, I'm cooked. I, I will submit to the magisterium of the church. I get it. I don't understand justification by faith. I don't get the Mary thing, but I will do whatever. This is Christ's church, and I will submit to its authority, and I will learn and conform my theological positions and my life to the church. Please let me, <laughs> please, <laughs> please let me in. Please, please, please let me quick, in, you know? Quick, quick, quick. Right. <laughs> That's really what did, emo you've got the emotion down. Yeah. Uh, so she said, let me call you back. And she called me back shortly thereafter and said, you, you, we've been given permission to receive you into the church. Ah, oh, beautiful. So come next Saturday. 
Next so I, Saturday. The, so that was the Sunday. I so the next Saturday. So I didn't have a sponsor. So I showed up Saturday, and they have, of course, the you know the the mass goers on Saturday, and they had to get a volunteer. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. <laughs> but so you know, will somebody be Dan's sponsor? We have to have a name, and we have to. And so this wonderful gentleman raised his hand and said, I'll do it. I don't even remember who his name or who. God bless him. I hope he's watching today. I know. If you're watching, please please send an email to Dan. Please pray for me. <laughs> please, <laughs> please pray for me. Um, and uh, so I was received and confirmed on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Oh, oh, July 16th. It's my birthday. <laughs> it's Is it my really? Birthday. You're kidding me. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. How beautiful. And I didn't Our know anything. Our blessed lady. Right. On, I mean, on, on Carmel and Teresa and right. John and woohoo. Yeah. And I didn't even know, for instance, that the feast existed. I, I had no, I had some sense of liturgical cycles, of course, with yeah. the Anglican tradition. But I had no sense of the Catholic saints and how that all worked and, oh, and wow. the importance of that day. So it's just a miracle upon miracle, I think. What know? year was that? It was in 2005. Really and true. Yeah. My goodness sakes. That is so amazing. I am so excited. I, I'm excited to be Catholic. I, well, I can well imagine. And I'll bet you every time you approach the Eucharist, you just praise and honor God and glorify His name and just, you know. Well, every, oh, every Eucharist, this is what's so amazing. Every, we're meeting God Himself yeah. every time. And, and I, I don't remember which saint said it, you probably know, but uh, this morning when I was in, uh, or it was at, uh, yesterday when I was in Mass, I was thinking to myself, every, in every encounter with Christ in the Eucharist, we have all that we need in that one encounter to become a saint. Mm. All that we need in that one encounter to become a saint. I don't know who said that, but I'm gonna look it up. I, you know, one of the, uh, before we go to the break, one of the quotes from a saint that thrills me and brings tears to my eyes every time I think about it, it comes from St. John Damascene. Mm -hmm. This is a paraphrase, but it's close. And he says, when I am asked how it is that when I pronounce the sacred words over bread and wine, they become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, I say, it is like what happened to Our Lady at the moment of her Annunciation. Mm -hmm. Isn't that incredible? It is. I mean, what a treasure is ours in the faith. And you know, friends, I just want to encourage you, you know, dig deeply into the sacramental structure of our Catholic faith. Dig deeply into the mystery that you have the opportunity of entering into every time you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this little prayer. It's a wee prayer. Pray it. Pray it at the beginning of Mass. Pray it at the moment of consecration. Pray it. Pray it as you are about to receive our Lord into your own body. Say, Lord, take me deeply into these sacred mysteries and may these sacred mysteries enter deeply into me. It'll transform your life. We're going to be back with our guest, Dan Burke, author of Navigating the Interior Life, available through Religious Catalog. Contact information for this will be up at the end of the program. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Dan Burke. And I, you know what? This has been a beautiful, beautiful series of programs. He's taken us on a beautiful spiritual journey as he shared with us his spiritual journey. And we were just talking about the fact that when we share these marvelous deeds that God has done in our lives, it edifies others and builds them up. And I was sharing with him, I'm edified by what he's sharing with us. And I'm praying that it's being communicated to you, too. What a great grace it is to share the marvelous deeds of the Lord. It truly is. And he does that for 
for us in his book, Navigating the Interior Life, Spiritual Direction and the Journey to God, available for you through Religious Catalog, info at the end of the program. And I've got another great resource available for you, and it's located at our website, womenofgrace.com. And that beautiful resource is WOG exclusive. It's a subscribership program. All of our programs are archived for you there, including the ones that you're watching this week and today. And we invite you to become a member of WOG exclusive just so you have the means that you need to enter into this abundant life of our Lord Jesus Christ more deeply and to share that abundant life with others. Our saint of the week is Saint John of the Cross. Could there be a better saint? Maybe only his, uh, uh, his, his, his beautiful, beautiful uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. The two of them together, what great good they've done for us in our spiritual journeys as they continue to lead us to divine union. So we do ask Saint John of the Cross, please do pray for us. I, you know, Dan, I want to also mention too, to our viewers that you have an excellent resource and your excellent resource is your website <clears throat> rcspiritualdirection.com right, right. and you know this is a beautiful website you've got to get out there and check it out it's beautiful rcspiritualdirection.com it's Dan's website and uh, you have a, a, a co-editor with well, you a Father. full-time editor uh, who, who uh, is uh, volunteers and and uh, coordinates all of our writers and uh, we have Ralph Martin has just agreed to begin to contribute to the oh, site. Oh, that's marvelous. Yeah, he's fantastic. He and is. He's a great gift. So we have some writers that you would know and others you wouldn't, but really we're trying to provide a, a broad cross-section of Catholic spirituality from Carmelite to Carthusian to Dominican, and we're, we're uh, working with different writers all the time to help bring forth the great riches of the church. Yeah, what a great gift that is. Well, speaking of great riches of the church, the spiritual life is what it's all about. Right. And um, you know, you, you shared with us about coming into the faith now. And you said something very interesting to me that I think might, people might have said, oh, like that, you know, when you said it. And what you said was, you know, you were actually in the purgative way before you entered into the church. Yeah. And some people think, well, these ways, the spiritual life can't begin until you're in the church. But that's not the case. No. They can, I'm guessing that lots of individuals out there are in one of these ways of entering more deeply into union with God and are unaware of it. So let's talk a little bit about these three ways. And let's begin at the beginning with the purgative. Why do you say you were in the purgative way? What defines or features that stage of the spiritual life? Well, you opened the series, you described appropriately the best analogy for the three ways, which is uh, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Well, uh, every one of us is born, right? Yes. And so that birth in the, in the natural life is mirrored in the spiritual by baptism. And so I uh, received Christ, if you will, and was baptized in that Baptist church. That began my spiritual journey, as does uh, baptism for every Catholic. Now, of course, uh, we might stunt our growth by our choosing sin and wandering from that path and the promises of our baptism, whether it be in our youth or, or adult uh, a, uh, periods. But that is really the beginning of the purgative way. So that, uh, for instance, our bro brothers and sisters in the Protestant world are, are all who have been baptized and truly in relationship with the Lord are uh, in some uh, phase of the spiritual life. And I think you'd probably agree that it's extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to achieve the latter stages, and, my, and this is my, I'll state it as my opinion, without the sacraments that the Catholic Church provides in the presence of Christ, the grace of Christ in those sacraments. But um, certainly, if you know and love Christ and he dwells within you, you can make progress. Yeah, Th this purgative way, and, and I guess it, it might be a good thing to state that, you know, um, and you do this so masterfully in your book, uh, even though we talk about these as stages, it's not like we leave the stage behind, yeah. right? There's, these stages are always part of our ongoing growth yeah. in union with God, no matter even if we've attained the heights of, unitive, uh, of the unitive stage, which few attain to the maximum, uh, some do, uh, maybe more than we think, frankly. But the fact of the matter is, um, we, we never really set aside these stages. They're always evident within every level of union with God that we achieve, right? Yeah, and of course, the, the, they vary in the degree of intensity. For instance, uh, I have a 22-year-old son who uh, mostly acts like a man, but sometimes a boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, th there's that uh, understanding of human development that you can translate a bit into spiritual. So my wife the other night said to me that I, that she hopes I always have 
a little bit of boy in me because uh, she knows that I do, and I said I do too. So there's these uh, elements of us that are good that we never leave behind in our maturation, but in the spiritual life, as an example, everyone in the purgative way, if they want to make progress, uh, should begin a life of prayer, must begin a life of prayer. And so that may begin as simple as five minutes a day praying a decade of the rosary. Well, so in the sense that you describe, I would say that, that uh, when you're in the unitive way and you're, uh, you're fully integrated in your soul and your spirit and uh, in union with God, that doesn't mean you stop praying the rosary. You don't need the rosary. You don't need the things that you pick up in those early stages of going to confession on a regular basis, that sort of thing. But you bring them with you because they're always necessary for the divine life. So in that sense, it's true. Um, in another sense, it's not true in that we, you know, there is a point where a, a, a woman is no longer a girl. Right? Yes, yes. And uh, St. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child and thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so there is a progression uh, where when you're in the stage, you demonstrate the predominant dispositions, mm -hmm. uh, the predominant characteristics, but yet you never, it's like climbing a mountain. Yes. So you never, the base of the mountain is always important to your ascent and yes. altitude, right? Um, but uh, you certainly, um, once you've prayed the rosary a thousand times in the purgative stage, uh, it never leaves your lips in a way, uh, especially with saints like um, Teresa of Calcutta and others, where it never leaves your lips in the latter stages. It's not something you set aside. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think that that's very true. Uh, the word purgative happens to be an adjective, so it's right. describing the stage. The noun for purgative is is purgation. Exactly. So of what, and, and, and the root of that is purge. Yeah. So of what are we purging ourselves? It, and it's different in each stage, and, and the first two in particular, but in the purgative stage, and just uh, to be clear, this is not a stage quite like the human development cycle. So we've talked about the similarities. Mm -hmm. might be good to contrast uh, the dissimilarities and then come back. But the dissimilarities are that no matter how old you are, you can be spiritually mature, immature. Mm -hmm. So you can be very young in the faith, like St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, who was, I think, died when she was 24. Mm -hmm. St. Catherine of Siena was very young and had achieved the unitive stage. So you can be very old in the, uh, in the physical development life cycle, but very young spiritually or immature. But you can also be very young and very mature spiritually. So just, uh, that's where the dissimilarities occur. So in, the other thing that's dissimilar is that in the, in the age, uh, as we age and develop in the human sense, uh, there's a clear beginning and end to a year and a leaving of that year and a new year. With the purgative stage, it can last 20 years or it can be one year depending on uh, St. John of the Cross uh, that we're talking about today as the saint in the, in the past programs, uh, gives you a program in the, um, in the dark night of how you can, he, he specifically says, if you want to get through this really quickly, th here's the formula, right? <laughs> and then he enunciates that. But uh, it can be very long for us, for St. Teresa of Avila. It was much longer, for instance, than it was for St. Therese of Luzo. So to your question. Uh, what are we purging, our, purging ourselves of? What is the purgation? Early on, it's most likely mortal sin. For me, it was that. Uh, it, you know, when you come out of hell as I did, you bring pieces of hell with you. Uh, you, you bring a very disordered, disrupted, injured soul. Mm. That is, for me, what, I was not healed all at once. I was healed of many things all at once. Many other things I was not, and those who love me and know me very well can attest to those, those things. But early in the purgative stage, it's really this uh, habitual mortal sin that is the first target of the Lord to take from us and replace with His Holy Spirit and His love and His grace. Um, as we move in deeper into the purgative way, which spans all the way from this wrestling with mortal sin all the way to some early uh, potential experiences of mystical graces. But in between there, we begin to battle venial sins, habitual mm -hmm. venial sins. As we, as we leave that stage uh, with respect to sin, we are then beginning to battle imperfections. Mm -hmm. So those, that's a little bit of a picture of the battle of yeah. the purgative stage. Yeah, and it's beautifully stated. And um, 
I want to, we've got a minute, but I just want to mention this as quickly as I can because I find it interesting and w in line with this comparison to physical maturation. And, you know, uh, f uh, St. Thomas talks about this, St. Thomas Aquinas, and then Gar uh, Reginald Garigou Lagrange. He's brilliant. Thomas. Yeah, brilliant. Talks about, you know, the three ages of conversion. Mm -hmm. And he says that as we're leaving, and, and I want you to hear this because it's important, friends, as we're leaving one stage and moving into the other stage, you know, you've got that process between childhood and adolescence where puberty sets in. Not a pleasant moment, really. The type of uh, suffering of the body, really, because mm -hmm. it's changing, you know. Uh, typically, that movement is marked by a great cross. It is. You know, it's marked by a great cross. So as we conclude our program today, I want you to think about the cross that's in your life today. And I want you to maybe like uh, look at it from a supernatural perspective. Could it be possible that the cross you're struggling with right now, I don't know, finances, health, you know, a, a child is driving you nuts or a spouse that's unfaithful, I don't know what it is. Is it possible that God wants to use this cross to move you from one stage of the spiritual life into the next? It's a possibility. Just consider it. Well, you see on the screen there how you can get Dan's book. We love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.